Okay. Hi, uh, my name's Al Beck. I'm the Director of Psychology and Psychotherapy at South London, the Maudsley NHS Trust. And I'd like to welcome you to what will be a series of broadcasts, um, which we will be running on the theme of psychological resilience building. In this series of broadcasts, we'll be exploring how psychologists and psychotherapists from a wide range of backgrounds and practices are working with community groups to build on their strengths and help them uh, or help to make our communities more resilient. Most of the work of preventing the development of mental health problems takes place outside of secondary mental health care services, such as a mental health trust. It happens in local communities where groups of people, and particularly people with lived experience, work together to bring about social change. I want to illustrate the work which can be done by psychological practitioners out of secondary care mental health services to promote the psychological resilience of individuals and communities. That's not to undermine the brilliant work done by um, psychological practitioners in secondary mental health care, or indeed any of the brilliant clinicians in secondary mental health care. However, um, the work that's done outside, as I've said, is so very, very important and so very much part of the long term plan for mental health. The work of psychological practitioners in the community is rarely done alone. We work together with others and sometimes other those are other professionals, but more often they're local charities or community groups, and almost always with people who have lived experience of health inequalities. Over the coming weeks, I'll be interviewing an exciting range of people from all parts of the health and social care system, from large char charities to small community groups, from people working in primary care or in uh, NHS community settings to groups of people bound only by where they live or areas of mutual interest from large housing groups to small care providers. What binds them all is a burning ambition to address health and social inequalities. They all seek to change the health of the population through harnessing the strengths of local people and empowering them to, the, to manage their emotional and practical challenges. We've all felt the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. It's had a damaging effect on us physically and mentally, on our sense of ourselves, our ability to cope, our relationships, our economy, our global and local partnerships. But the pandemic hasn't affected everyone in the same way. Some groups of people have felt the impact of the virus much more than others because they're already vulnerable and they know um, and they found themselves particularly at, at risk. Witness, for example, the disproportionate impact of the virus on black people or on the poor. In this series, we'll meet some of the amazing organisations and individuals in our communities who are trying to address these health and social inequalities, and we'll learn about how about the innovative ways they're trying to bring about social change. So I'm hosting these broadcasts for everyone to take part in. Wherever you are in the country, you're welcome to take part. Perhaps you even know of a project or a piece of psychological resilience building work that we could showcase. My hope is that commissioners, community groups, charities, statutory providers, arm's length bodies and many others will learn about psychological resilience building work and will want to find out more about how they can promote it. So please take part in the broadcast by asking questions in the question and answer function or con contact me afterwards by our web link, which I've also put there. I'm going to begin by introducing a really, really exciting project and we're very, very lucky to have them. I'm going to ask the speakers to introduce themselves because I think they're best placed to do that. So over to you, starting with Bill. Hi, I'm Bill Sidnam, I'm Chief Executive, Thames Reach. Um, so we're a, we're a medium sized charity working with homelessness and particularly with people who sleep on the streets of London. Um, me personally, I've been working for Thames Reach around 20 years in a variety of different jobs before I became chief, uh, chief executive. But I've been working this field, the field of homelessness, for all my working life, which is uh, quite a long time. Um, so um, it's really interesting to see how health has been such an important part of what we do and to see and be involved in the innovations around working with psychology uh, that we're going to talk to you about today. Isabel. Isabel. 
Hi, I'm Isabel McKenna. So I'm the area manager for Thames Reaches Hostels at the moment. Um, I've been lucky enough to work in a number of different hostels, mainly with Thames Reach, but some with other charities. Um, at most levels, I came into the sector about 10 years ago as a trainee, and I then went on to key work and then into management. And um, so while I do sometimes come across like a one trick pony, I do know hostels quite well and mm -hmm. enjoy working in them. I'm sure you're far from a one trick pony, Isabel. James. Hi, I'm James Pezzi. I'm a clinical psychologist with a special interest in community psychology approaches. I'm the operational lead for Lambeth Psychology and Hostels project, and we're a SLAM uh, South London and Maudsley NHS Trust team. We are working with a team of psychologists and an art therapist more recently to provide psychologically informed environments and trauma informed care. Apologise for the jargon across a range of settings and doing so in partnership with local third sector partners across Westminster and Lambeth, but primarily focused on homelessness and in Lambeth, primarily on our partnership with Thames Reach. So thanks guys. Um, I'd like to start by asking you um, questions and you can pick up how you want to answer them and who wants to answer them. Um, can I start though by asking you what's the work of Thames Reach and how does the work address the mental health needs of the people that you serve and build their psychological resilience? Uh, Bill, you're on mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I'll start, um, but then hand over to Isabel, who, who's much more involved in the um, the day to day, particularly the psychology aspects of what we do. But as an organisation, um, I, I said earlier that we work primarily with around rough sleeping. So we work with people who are sleeping rough. We have outreach teams who go out and find people on the streets and get them in. We also do quite a lot of work around prevention. So trying to get to people before the damage that sleeping rough um, does to people is done to them. Um, we run services that help people move on from homelessness, um, so uh, tenancy support and uh, employment work. And we're also interestingly um, part of a mental health alliance in Lambeth um, that aims to really broaden the, the offer to people with uh, significant mental health problems in Lambeth and to, to use our skills as, a, if you like, a generic service provider, a social service provider to help people alongside clinicians. But one of the things we do and what Isabel is going to say a bit, bit more about uh, is run hostels, particularly in Lambeth. And, and hostels um, are really aimed at people who have been homeless, but also have significant other support needs, as we would describe them, but often significant trauma in their lives. And it's where we do our most um, intensive and sustained work with people. So I'm going to hand over to Isabel to say a bit, of that, a bit about that. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, so as Bill says, in our hostels at the moment are in Lambeth. We work with about 135 residents on any given day. They move in for up to two years, um, but sometimes as little as for as six to 12 months. Our aim is to support people. We do that in loads of practical ways as an organisation with budgeting, uh, building life skills, digital inclusion. Um, but everybody who lives in our hostel has been assessed as a vulnerable adult with a significant enough level of need and usually risk, which means that they need 24 hour staff presence. So that's really the um, the service that we offer. So lots of people, as I say, need practical support, but I would I think I'd be safe to say that the majority of the people that we house have really significant levels of complex trauma. So they're carrying with them many, many reasons that they are engaging in the levels of substance misuse that they that they are alcohol use. Um, they have often undiagnosed or incorrectly diagnosed mental health difficulties. I would say James would be able to, to talk more about that. But we need to offer both the practical side um, of things, but also the deeper psychological support. And that's where the Psychology and Hostels project comes in. And um, so since about 2012, we've been running it in, in various guises in the hostels, which James can can give a little bit more information about. But I think it might be useful to use an example to kind of explain the sorts of work that we do. Uh, I'm going back a few years now, but we were working with a young woman in one of our largest hostels at the time in Lambeth. She was extremely abusive and challenging with the chefs in the canteen, constantly shouting at them, screaming, making their lives pretty difficult. 
as a staff team, she, she was also really demanding outside of mealtimes, always asking for cereal at times which the team felt were inappropriate. There's a lot going on in a hostel, as you can imagine. We have to run a safe building and a service for usually up to about 50 people. So the team were really challenged. They found it really difficult. They didn't know really what to do, how to engage with this woman. So we had a reflective practice session with the psychologist. And we we were able in that session in a way that we wouldn't have been able to without a psychologist, I don't think, really explore what our early life might have looked like, what a life in care might look like when it comes to food, to engaging with the providers of food and how that may have built up into a picture of, of challenge and deprivation. And it had a really simple, not solution, I would say, but a really simple way through, which is that the psychologist helped us to understand that it was OK to just give her cereal whenever she wanted it. What, you know, who were we harming to just offer it, have it ready, in fact, in specially, you know, special boxes, shower this woman with cereal if that's what it took. And what it led to was far more opportunities for engagement, far more opportunities to talk to her about what was really going on. And it allowed the team to kind of um, let go of the frustration that they were experiencing, I would say, and maybe just take the chefs out of the equation who had a hard enough job as it was. Uh, so it, sometimes this work, I think, is about very simple seeming solutions, but actually getting there can be quite a complex process. I don't know, James, if you want to add anything about the partnership in general or about psychology. Uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, I suppose Bill and Isabella both sort of indicated the centrality of trauma in homelessness. And that's a point I was really keen to emphasise that the way we conceptualise it, homelessness arises very often from the traumatic experiences that people have been through and itself becomes a cause of trauma. So there's a sort of vicious circle that operates in the relationship between trauma and homelessness. And Isabel was referring to the high levels of both diagnosed and undiagnosed mental health difficulties we see in this population um, that are nine times more likely to commit suicides, the levels of sort of diagnosable um, first, uh, mental health difficulties are somewhere in the region of 80% in wide scale um, surveys and in the land population we believe it to be significantly higher than that, something in the region of 71% of people meeting diagnosis. Uh, diagnosable criteria for personality disorder. The project itself is an approach to try to support those well-being needs of a relatively uniquely marginalised and disenfranchised group of people. Um, we're looking to integrate mental health services within and alongside Thames Ridge to create these psychologically informed environments where psychological input is provided right across the range of service delivery so that we try to provide a sort of psychological container for the whole project, wrapping the thing in a, a kind of psychological envelope and having a really shared leadership approach to doing that. So it's not about the psychologist uh, sort of doing psychology on the hostel, but using psychological ideas alongside the management to think about how we can, I mean, obviously they have a lot to give us in terms of how you would run a hostel and the challenges that come along with that. And so it's thinking about how we can share our, our respective expertise in doing that. We then look to do indirect work like the reflected practices that uh, Isabel is referring to and consultations with the staff, offering training where that's appropriate as well. And they give us an opportunity to have much more informal contact with this client group who otherwise would be very difficult to reach. And so a lot of our work is actually doing things like playing games or gardening or having cups of tea with the clients and building up a relationship through everyday things but informed by a psychological understanding of the difficulty that the clients often have in tolerating proximity particularly with mental health services but more generally um, and slowly coming alongside people getting us to a position where we're able to do direct work as well but the whole thing is the work the partnership and the, the projects themselves are the psychological intervention rather than just the therapy work that we also deliver Thanks a lot. Following on, on from that, James, I just wonder if there's anything you'd like, anything more you'd like to say about um, how being a psychological practitioner has given you skills for this work, or, or maybe, you know, uh, how, you know, what particular skills you bring to this work, or maybe have had to learn in order to do this work. Sure. Um, 
I mean, I think one of the advantages of being a clinical psychologist in this role is that we are essentially a sort of jack of all trades uh, profession, that we are able to draw on multiple models and ways of thinking about distress. Um, so in that sense, I think we're well suited where we aren't in control of our referral path, where we're working with anyone that presents to us and we can kind of pull on whatever relevant theory might be useful or if we don't know we can we know how to go away and find out about it i think like that the training of a psychologist really suits well with those challenges um uh, sort of like another like really key thing that i've taken from my training and my experience with psychologists is recognizing and working with trauma um and so of course when we're talking about trauma being such a like uh, a dominant part of the picture for so many people in hostels that can be really useful and recognising and helping staff to recognise that in themselves and in the client group as well I think is something that we can really bring that's valuable to the partnership. I guess also we have our sort of core therapeutic skills and the relationship building skills that come along with the training as a psychologist that are obviously really useful when we're actually getting into the nitty gritty and delivering therapy to people. Uh, in terms of things like staff training and support and particularly the skills that we've developed in reflective practice um, that's something that I think a psychologist can really add value to a psychologically informed environment and, and think about how you're managing group processes and um, sort of using making those spaces the most useful they can be kind of in a more um, I'm not quite sure how to put it in a more practical way um, also understanding the mental health system itself and helping non-clinicians to navigate and influence that system on behalf of the clients that we're working with I think is something that we found psychologists can really contribute in and, and more widely than that in deploying uh, what I think of as our social capital as psychologists to influence the wider systems on behalf of the partnership. It may not have been what was envisaged uh, when the partnership was developed but we found that we are able to, to help Thames Reach and the managers of the hostels to to influence like other wider partners to, to make changes that like, might be working with the police or with commissioners to think about where this or that needs to change. Uh, I think sometimes having the weight of, of psychology and the mental health trust behind us uh, is helpful there too. Uh, That's really helpful. Yeah. Oh, no, sorry. thank you. I, I, well, no, I just wanted to bring Bill in at this point and, and ask him a little bit about the about the um, partnership and how uh, that's working for Thames Reach and how that's you know what what he sees as being the the advantages of this partnership and 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 maybe any disadvantages he sees I don't know you know what's the experience been like sure I mean I think well, the, the elephant in the room with all this is that the services that we run and particularly hostel services and services like them have experienced really significant funding cuts over the last 10 years so while we still run the hostels, we have to staff them on a, on a basis all the time. Our capacity to do the stuff we'd like to do is in, has been very much reduced over the last 10 years. So um, yeah. in the past, we would have had time to spend much more time with people, to talk to people, to take people out um, and to I don't know, do activities that didn't regard, didn't relate just to managing the safety of the hostel and helping people move on. Our capacity to do that is incredibly reduced. And one of the key things that psychology offers us is two things really. One is to keep a focus on the importance of that kind of work. So we're not just transactional and running the hostel. It also, through the psychologist, gives us some extra capacity to do that with people. So as James was saying, talk to people. Um, play games with people, do art with people that, that really often our staff really don't have the time to do. They're managing a 50 bed hostel. Um, there's two staff on at night. They're really busy often. Um, so that's one thing. But I think also um, that idea we've talked about, about a bit already around engagement. So having the time to work with people with different head on, if you like, um, and, and to help us think of different ways of working with people who can be incredibly challenging at times and we are in the position as people as, as an organization that manages the hospital of, of of setting boundaries and often people understandably we will challenge those boundaries given their history i think um, that in the past um, you can go for very you know there has sometimes been taken a very straightforward approach that says these are the boundaries if you cross them 
um, sanctions will will result. And I think that psychology has helped us look at people, look at that in a far more person-centered way to look at where people are coming from, understand how we can work with those and how we can respond differently. I think as, as Isabel, Isabel was saying, she might want to say more about this, but she's done much more than me. But I think one of one of the the examples, I think, I, you know, one of the examples of where it's worked for us is being able to work with people differently and talk to people differently. Um, for psychologists to work with our staff team to help us develop different approaches um, means that we can work with people in a much less reactive way. We can work with people towards a planned goal. So an example of that would be people's engagement with health services. So moving the, 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 the example that I often quote about the early days of psychology in hostels was one of our residents at one of our schemes was using a and &E more than once a day. So was going down there, it was their source of support and help. Um, by working with psychologists, or initially with psychologists, and then that psycho that approach spreading throughout the team or, or, or being agreed throughout the team, we were able to move that engagement with health services, which was needed because this gentleman had real health problems, from going to a &E more than once a day to actually engaging with GP, engaging with um, treatment, um, and actually working much more effectively. So taking courses of medication and becoming weller, physically weller as well as uh, mentally weller. And I think that that's a real good example of the kind of thing that we're trying to achieve. But I don't know if uh, Isabel wants to say more about that. I wonder if I could just come back on you or, there, or Phil, others. because, um, <laughs> and, and obviously we'll pass over to you in a minute, Isabel, because it is it is a really interesting and important area. But um, I'm just uh, really struck by a number of things you've said, and it's very powerful and, and, and moving shared experience, you know, of empowering a service user to, to really just make better use of services in pursuit of reaching their own goals. A and E isn't good for anyone and it's certainly no, no. A, a very expensive way of of um of harming ourselves really um by repeatedly presenting this. I think it would be in all of our interests for that to reduce. But um I, there's been a number of questions in the chat around who pays for this service. And I was very mindful of what you said about, you know, you've had cuts to your to your mm. funding. Um, and there's also a, a comment in the chat, and, and I think we've all seen, you know, the, the, the reductions in the number of people, homeless people on the streets at the moment and during the pandemic, and a, a belief that there's been maybe perhaps more investment in care of the homeless. Is, is that true? Could you tell us a little bit about that? So two questions there. So in, in terms of who pays, um, interestingly enough, Psychology and Hospitals, as it's originally conceived, was paid for by a charitable grant from Guys and St. largely through Guys and St. Thomas's charity. I think one of the things that we jointly have tried to do over the years was to try and get a recognition this should be part of a mainstream service as, as opposed to an add-on. I think we're, we're at that stage now, so it's now part, it's funded as a health service that goes into hostels. Um, that's good um, and it's really important that we if you like, advocate for the for the the importance of that being a, a core service as opposed to an add-on that can be lost when things get tight. And I think I think we've come a long way over the past ten years or eight years or how long we've been running it. In terms of homeless people in hotels, yes, there's been lots of additional investment to get people into temporary accommodation. So hotels, people have heard about lots of people who are sleeping rough or in unsafe accommodation have been accommodated in temporary accommodation in hotels and other similar places. I think our challenge now, um, challenge that's faced by Thames Reach, along, along with other homelessness organisations, is how we move those people to more permanent accommodation so we don't just chuck them out when things are all right. Um, we're doing a lot of work around that and there's a lot of central government funding to help us do that, which is channeled through local authorities. It's very specific. It doesn't help us with the core services that we run at the moment. They're still in the same position as they were before. And I think also it's probably important, I mean, for me to just say something about homelessness and rough sleeping and just who we're talking about, because I think what we're not talking about in terms of the people who use our hostels are people who have lost their tenancy last week. They're people who have had a long history of long, quite traumatic history of engagement services. Um, they're broadly speaking people for whom the system hasn't worked so they have they've gone along to their council 
they may have got some sort of temporary housing some years ago that broke down and things spiraled. So they, they're at a point often in their lives where those social networks that would support most of us to manage a difficult period of homelessness. So we lost our accommodation. We'd stay with friends. We'd have people to turn to. Largely speaking, the people that we work with in our hostels don't have anyone to turn to apart from us. So they're people that it's not the first thing that has gone wrong in their lives. And, and as uh, James and Isabel have said, it's the it's the result of early trauma and you know a whole cascade of things going wrong. So this is who we're talking about. We're not really talking about homelessness in general. Um, we're talking a specific subgroup of people who have um, really quite significant um, support needs. Thanks, Bill. Um, Isabel, I'm um, just going to pass over to you now, just maybe ask you to talk a little bit more about um, uh, maybe the impact of the of the work that you do on the people that you serve. And you, you've talked quite uh, a lot about the you know the reflective spaces and the and the need for support can you say a little bit more about the themes that have maybe come up in those groups for people certainly um another example i was going to give and i think it's also a good example of how the partnership has quite long tentacles as it were it's not always about who the psychologists are directly working with um but for example i i left working with a um in the waterloo project which had psychology in-house i moved from there to manage a different service where there wasn't a psychologist present but because of the understanding and i think more importantly the confidence that i had gained through those reflective spaces and the kind of psychological the language that I had gained, I was able to work with the staff team there around looking at um, aggression as being often based in fear, which again, I, I will repeat myself to say sometimes these ideas are very simple, but by repeating them and working with a staff team to understand that actually somebody throwing a fire extinguisher down a hallway is often because they're terrified and not because they want to hurt the staff team. So I felt there, I'm thinking of a particular client that we, we really did avoid at least three times a very close call eviction where they they would have been evicted most likely to the street possibly to a shorter term service often you know boroughs i'm thinking of westminster here as the example they would have somewhere to sort of catch somebody like that but you lose all of that work then you lose all of those relationships that have been built over time so by working with the team to see that even though something quite extreme might have happened if we can change our approach to that person, actually their behaviour might change as well. Um, but just to pick up on some of the questions um, that have been coming up, there there is sometimes resistance, and James might be able to give us a little bit, some more um, thought or examples of this, but there can be resistance, of course, from housing staff and support staff to working with psychology. For some people, that's a, it's a threatening thing to have psychology enter their workplace. They can think, oh, I don't, I don't want that person in my head. But to be honest, I think, again, repetition, showing that actually in the reflective practice spaces, we're, we're talking about work here. We're not asking people to share anything about their home lives, anything that's going on, and unless they you know, feel it's appropriate and it can be managed appropriately. We're talking about the nuts and bolts of how we work with these clients every day. And that's what the teams want to talk about. You know, it's what they want to vent about. Thanks so much. I can really see how the project is, is well embedded and, and uh, reached out throughout and had impact throughout the, the whole of the way in which you're working. Just want to call on um, Liv now at the end of the uh, this Q&A session just to say, is there anything you've seen, any questions that you'd like to, that you think we need to pose here that we we haven't been able to pick up on because it's very difficult to read the chat function at the same time as a speak. Uh, thank you, Al. Yes, there have been lots of questions, so thank you very much to everyone who's got in touch. And um, I've just posted a comment saying thank you for your contributions, and if you contact us with your email addresses, we can get back in touch with you. For now, though, there was a question, uh, Al, which was about um, this seems like a psychologically challenging work for the care staff delivering support for people. Um, and I wonder if you could share a little bit more about what the themes of the staff have been in the support groups, if possible. James, is that something that you um, feel that you could pick up on? Or if you came off mute? That would help, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, so I've been doing this work for about six years now, um, and 
there are repeated themes that come up in terms of the frustrations of the work and, and feelings like a feeling of stuckness is often part of what we're dealing with. And we can really see the link between that feeling of stuckness and burnout. Um, and I suppose one of the kind of the broad themes of what we're trying to do in terms of the staff support is to make people like to some extent understand that changes may be small for people, um, particularly where you're coming fresh into the sector, that can be a difficult thing to get your head around, I think, sometimes, and that really celebrating small changes is an important thing to do, but also that those small changes can build up and sort of cascade in a positive way into, into really more meaningful change further down the line. Um, and also in doing that to try and get people in touch and sort of moving from a place of unconscious competence where they're there are lots of things that they're doing really well to a place where they're conscious of the, the competence that they do have. And I think that can, again, be protected against burnout. So that's so one of the most common themes that comes up. That's fine. Have we got time for another? No, we haven't got time for another question. I think we've come to the end now of our of our Q&A and our broadcast. So it just remains for me to thank our um, speakers. It's been really interesting to see the work that you the fantastic work that you've been doing. I'm sure that people will have many more questions and I, I would encourage them to email us to contact us on our website and we'll pass those questions on to you and maybe set up some fruitful conversations there but thanks very much james isabel and bill and and all the best of luck for the great work that you do thanks everyone.